So welcome everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. As you know, and many of you do participate, we're doing an ongoing series of small participant intensive conversations about Russia's war in Ukraine. We've had a number of US generals. We've had Ukrainian parliamentarians. We had recently Alex Stubb, the former prime minister of Finland and others. And now we have our friend, Tom Tugendhat from London. Uh, Tom, your lower third says Pia Charles, your assistant. It's fine by me, but I just wanna be clear about that. Tom, you're among friends. We're eager to hear from you. You all know Tom is chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He is a leading voice on defense and strategic matters. He's a uh, polyglot, is that the right word? Uh, with deep experience in foreign affairs, uh, including in service. So, so Tom, thanks for making time. We'll do a hard stop 45 minutes past the hour. So that's uh, 1045 Eastern, if I have it right. And uh, here goes. Uh, we're eager to hear from you, Tom, about the state of the debate in the UK. We're eager to hear from you about how you assess the war at this point. And I posed to you earlier off camera or off Zoom, so to speak, uh, the question whether our war aims are clear and whether we're resourcing clear objectives. But Tom, as you wish, welcome. We're eager to hear from you and we'll join with a number of questions very soon. Oh, good. No, I'm going to say good afternoon because it's afternoon here and I have no idea where all of you are. So I presume you're, you're somewhere all over the United States and possibly all over the world. Um, I'm going to start off with just talking for a few minutes about where I see things, but I'm, I'm probably not going to cover half the subjects you're interested in. So I suspect this will get much more interesting when we have questions. So I'll be, I'll be brief. First of all, I think it's worth remembering what's happening. This is the first state on state conflict of a serious nature since the end of the Second World War. Now, I know that's not totally true in the sense that Russia has invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I know that they've occupied Donetsk and Luhansk. I know they've seized Crimea. But this is, I think we can all agree, a somewhat different scale of events. This is a, this is a moment where uh, the old norms, the pre, or sorry, the post-45 norms have been uh, at least shaken, if not shattered, uh, by the aggressive tendencies of a particular leader. This is a huge uh, uh, trial uh, of European and NATO resolve. It's a trial of the United States. Uh, and indeed, it's a trial of all democratic countries as we face off against what has to be seen as one of the most aggressive autocracies uh, the world has seen, certainly uh, in 80 years. And putting it in that context, I think is important because it reminds us why it matters, why it matters to us, uh, whether you're in the west coast of the United States, for which you feel safe and, 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 and a long way away, or whether you are somewhat closer to home in London or indeed uh, further over in the east in Poland or uh, Romania. It is an enormous challenge uh, to the Europeans, to us, to NATO and to the United States. And we've got various decisions to make, some of which we've made already, and some of which we remain uh, to decide. The first is, what does sovereignty mean in, uh, in 2022? Does it mean the ability to decide your friendships and your alliances? Does it mean your ability to decide your own future? Or does it mean uh, the acceptance that foreign domination, spheres of influence, if you will, uh, have a real uh, weight in international politics still? Does it mean that uh, various uh, different uh, powers, Russia, the United States, China, uh, can actually hold sway over neighboring states, or does it mean that they have the right to associate to decide their own futures? <clears throat> now, what we've, what we've seen in, in the last few weeks and months is that many of us have responded pretty quickly, in all honesty, to the threats to Ukraine. Uh, the United Kingdom, I think, under ben, ben Wallace, our defense secretary, was very quick to send out weaponry and others uh, have followed suit. And the Ukrainians have demonstrated a level of courage, frankly, that few people ex expected, and a commitment to defending themselves, their rights, uh, and indeed Western Europe against 
what has been an extraordinary hostile act. But that's only the beginning. The real question for us is what level of commitment are we willing to put in? Because the first stage, the stage that we've got to, really is only the beginning. The ability to resist further encroachment, which defended Kiev, which turned back the attacks on Kharkiv, uh, are really only the start. What we're now seeing is an incre increasingly grinding war uh, in the South that is incrementally moving uh, Ukraine a bit further to the West, or rather Ukrainian forces a bit further to the West each day. And the decision we've got to take is, what are we willing to do about it? Because the worst option, sadly, is the one that we're in at the moment. The worst option is giving the Ukrainians just enough to almost hold the line, but not so much that they can turn this around, not so much that they either win, in which case the war is resolved uh, in one direction, or lose, in which case the war is resolved in another. The worst is, if you like, the 1914 to 1918, uh, equality between forces, which sees quite literally thousands of young people murdered uh, on both sides um, and uh, protracted and growing instability flowing from it. Now, this is where the decisions really have to start to be made because Ukraine can win. There's no real doubt in my mind that Ukraine could win this conflict. And I don't mean win by capturing Moscow or you know, removing Putin. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is by retaking the territory that was lost since the 24th of February and possibly uh, pushing back to its own uh, UN recognized borders, internationally recognized borders uh, up against the Russian Federation. Now, whether that includes Crimea or not, I'm going to slightly gloss over at this point because that's a question for the Ukrainian people, not for me. But the Ukrainian government could have the capability to do it. But in order to have that capability, you need to look at why it is that Russia has normally won these smaller conflicts. And the reason Russia has normally won is because they've been able to accept pain at a level which many countries wouldn't, and had an industrial base which is able to supply them in a way that many countries can't. Now, when up against other countries, they've either found themselves against countries who wouldn't accept pain, or, or they've watched other countries who wouldn't accept the pain, and, and this is where you can look at conflicts like Iraq or Afghanistan and ask yourself about the casualty figures that we took. And you know, I say this as somebody who served in both those wars and sadly lost too many friends in each. In each of those conflicts, we demonstrated that we weren't willing to take the pain and the level that the, the, the Russians were, but we did have the industrial base that allowed us to dominate. The Russians have both against their near neighbors. Now, what they've got against Ukraine, or the difference with Ukraine, is that the Ukrainians have demonstrated they're willing to take the pain, they're willing to take the casualty figures that uh, Russians have traditionally accepted. But if they were to have the industrial base the US, and sadly only the US, can offer, then they would be able to not just match Russia, but they would be able to outmatch Russia. And the reality here is that this is... Uh, this is the question the United States must ask itself, because although, of course, it's true that European help matters, the reality is that Europe doesn't have the industrial base to resupply weapons and ammunition or body armor or all the other uh, material that is necessary in conflict at the rate at which it's being consumed in this operation. So only the US can truly be that ally that Ukraine needs now. I'm not going to get into your internal politics. I'm afraid you're all much better qualified to speak about that than I am. But the reality is that at the moment, the Biden administration has not made that decision clearly. It has promised, it has committed money, it has committed some resources, but it hasn't yet committed the level of resources that would allow the Ukrainians to turn this war from uh, defense to stalemate and into advance. And this is where I think we need to be quite clear what we're dealing with. We have a small window of opportunity to turn this around, and that window is basically the summer. Because come the end of the summer, Russian leverage increases dramatically. It increases dramatically because Russian energy exports, predominantly gas, will have to, a, a much greater influence on the outcome of European uh, decision making, and will be able to really transform the way in which uh, different European powers see alliances and see the need for a settlement of whatever nature. 
So the US administration, I would argue, has weeks, not months, but weeks to decide which side it's going to come down. And the moral, if you'll forgive me, but the moral argument is that it must decide early. Because if it is going to decide that it's not willing to give Ukraine the capabilities that it needs, then frankly, it should save young Ukrainian lives by helping Ukraine to come to a settlement that is achievable. And if it is willing to give them, then it should give them early to make sure that Ukrainians are able to uh, advance the fight to defend their borders. But if we wait, and this is the danger, if we wait, then the real politique of energy prices and uh, the onset of winter will transform the way in which uh, this war is conducted and the way in which allies and friends are able to support it. Now, that's not even touching on some of the secondary order effects of this conflict. I'm just going to touch on them very briefly. I'm sure others will have much better questions than I have answers. But those second order effects are things like population movement. Look, Poland has now, is now playing host to some two, two and a half million Ukrainians. And this is an extraordinary act of generosity, I think, by the, by the Polish people. I think we should recognize immediately that the Polish society has quite literally opened its doors to Ukrainian refugees. There are no Ukrainian refugee camps in Poland. There are homes that have welcomed visitors. And that's a remarkable achievement by the Polish people. It's an extraordinary act of generosity. The second area in which this raises questions is, of course, in the inflationary effects this is having on people around not just Europe, but around the world. First of all, of course, the energy prices, which I mean, I don't know, I don't know how uh, energy is looking in uh, the United States, but in the United Kingdom, petrol is now at uh, two pounds a litre, which is uh, roughly 80% uh, increase on where it was a few months ago, it was 120, 130, 140, it's now two pounds. So you, know, you can see that that's a serious increase. The second, of course, is in food. And I'm sure you all know much better than me, uh, Ukraine's grain exports, and indeed Russia's grain exports are a hugely important determinant on the stability of not just the Middle East, but actually Africa and the wider world. And the implication of these rising prices on the stability of countries you know, as far afield as Mali and Zimbabwe are uh, very materially affected by this conflict. So I'm going to I'm going to pretty much stop there because there are a number of ways in which we can take this conversation. I'm very happy to go wherever you wish, but I think this is fundamentally uh, a very important moment of decision making for the U.S. administration. Yes, with allies, of course, with allies, but when I see. Um, the French, German and Italian leaders going to Kiev without their Polish, Romanian, uh, Lithuanian, Latvian partners, I do begin to wonder how much time we have left to make a decision that will either reverse uh, the Russian advances or indeed come to a settlement that I think we, we all need to be able to accept. Um, thank you. I'm going to take the liberty of asking a first on the, the critical timing and the questions that uh, face the Biden administration right now. I'll let others comment on the likelihood of uh, those things happening in the timetable you suggested. Is there anyone in Western Europe, you've mentioned the French and Germans, but is there anybody in Western Europe who is knocking on the Biden administration's door making the case that you just made? Yes, Kaya Kalas is making that case uh, very effectively, I would argue, as Prime Minister of Estonia. Uh, and indeed, there are a few others who are also making the case in different ways. Um, it's certainly true that um, uh, many of those Eastern European states bordering, um, bordering Russia uh, feel this particularly keenly. I mean, you don't need me to tell you that uh, the way that uh, Putin has spoken about the Russian speaking communities in, in Eastern Ukraine uh, is exactly the same way as he's spoken about them in Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia. You don't need me to tell you that his recent um, bizarre historical, well, pseudo historical rant that he uh, promulgated to the Russian armed forces um, makes a statement of Russian imperial claims uh, that frankly, Peter the Great or even Tsar Nicholas would have been content with. In fact, Tsar Nicholas would have thought it a little expansionist even for him. So, you know, these are quite clearly uh, moments where uh, neighboring states uh, feel the pain or feel the, feel the likely consequences very keenly. 
And many of them are already beginning to make that case to the Biden administration. And in fact, they're making it to us too. And I can tell you that my phone is uh, regularly disturbed by foreign ministers from Eastern Europe uh, who are trying to make sure that we're aware of the implication that they feel. Thank you, Tom. We're gonna go to Bill Galston and after Bill, Matilda Fosting. Bill, you have the floor. Bill, you're muted. I'll be unmuted now. Hi, Bill. Uh, thank you once again. Hi, Tom. Uh, thank you once again for sharing your scarce time with us. It's a, it's a great service. Uh, I find myself agreeing with your conclusion, but questioning one of your premises. And it makes the material difference. So let me just put it on the table. I've spent a lot of time in recent weeks closeted with some of the best U.S. military analysts I can find. And they do not believe that a fully armed Ukraine would be able to fully reverse the Russian advances. They deserve every right to try, uh, but the consensus among the people I talk with is that they will not succeed. They can stabilize the line, you know, but they cannot substantially push the Russians back from their current line of battle. Uh, and they go on to argue that if our declared war aims on behalf of the Ukrainians are a full reversal of what has happened since February 24th, we will be leading them and ourselves astray. And the reason that makes a difference is that we think beyond the summer you know, to the possible next phase of this conflict, including diplomacy, the question of whether the Ukrainians will be able to regain sovereign control over their full territory becomes very material. So what gives you confidence that fully, a fully armed Ukrainian army would be able to reverse the tide of battle? So Bill, that's a fair question, and um, it, it's a it's a it's a genuine debate. I mean, it's you know there there are mixed views on this, and I've spoken. It won't surprise you to hear to former colleagues in the U.S. military and in other militaries around the world who are having exactly this debate. The reason I have greater confidence is because of what we've seen in the last whatever it is now four months. You know, I mean, I was in Kiev in. January, February, and speaking to people then, the general consensus was, first of all, <clears throat> you know, it's probably not going to happen. And if it does happen, the Ukrainians will be rolled over in a matter of hours, days, depending on who you believe, uh, and that they're in a, you know, they're in a much more precarious situation than we thought. But what we've seen, I think, in the last few months, is that the Ukrainians have internalized different lessons that we've taught, and a lot of them taught by British uh, military under Operation Orbital, as you know, the training team that supported the Ukrainian armed forces. They've internalized them to an extent that's much greater than actually we initially anticipated. You know, we thought that we were training them as best we could, but frankly, they were, you know, ex-Soviet forces, and, you know, there's only so much you can do in a few years, really. This is a massive cultural change, actually. You know, you can only get to a certain point. And the reality is their ability to assume what we call US military, I, I know practices this as well, mission command, the devolved uh, ability of uh, unit commanders to take on individual responsibility and, and exploit uh, different uh, opportunities is much greater than we thought. And we have also seen that the Ukrainian people have demonstrated a level of unity uh, that I don't think we expected. I mean, I think it's, it, it's worth coming back to President Zelensky here and to say, look, of course, and, you know, please don't think I'm taking anything away from him, but of course, his leadership in battle has been remarkable. You know, his courage in staying in Kiev, his courage in keeping his government together in Kiev has been absolutely phenomenal. But actually, his, his great political achievement actually happened just before that. His great political achievement happened in holding the country together. And despite the enormous pressures that the era of the oligarchs before him and various different ruptures within his own state between Ukrainian speakers and Russian speakers had 
had led us to believe that the country would fall apart. He's demonstrated a level of unity that frankly we weren't, we weren't expecting. Now, can I, can I promise you this, Bill? No, I can't, I can't promise you that. But what I can say is I can say that the capability demonstrated is much greater than anybody expected. It continues to be greater than many people expect uh, with significantly uh, fewer arms, ammunition, and indeed capabilities. The Ukrainian government, sorry, the Ukrainian forces continuously either resist or push back uh, and only where the Russian troops really mass heavy artillery uh, and uh, armor and personnel do we see the Russians making advances, which suggests to me that the level of capability that we could assist with, and not just us, but you know, countries like Turkey with its drone technology and, and uh, you know, uh, other forms of capability, would give the Ukrainians that ability that I think makes it possible. Now, the second part of your question, which you, you sort of, forgive me, Bill, but you sort, of, you, you sort of went through as though it was a, a statement that I'm, I'm going to challenge back on, is that this isn't our war ends. Our war ends have to be the support of a sovereign people to make its own determination. If President Zelensky turns mm -hmm. around and says, look, Mariupol is lost, I have no interest in taking it back, I'm willing to settle on the lines of today rather than the 24th of February, then, you know, it's up to him. And here I've been critical of my own government, of uh, Foreign Minister Truss, because it is not for the British Foreign Secretary or the US Secretary of State or anybody to define the war aims of the Ukrainian people, only they can define it. And that's, you know, they're the ones who are bleeding and dying. It's not for us to define that. But it is for us to recognize that they have a sovereign right uh, to the capabilities to defend themselves. And it is in our interest to make sure that they are able to exercise that right uh, by having an effective defense force. And so forgive me for putting back on that tiny element, Bill, but I don't define their war ends. Our war ends are the defense of NATO, which is a you know a well long established um, you know treaty uh, arrangement, and our aims therefore are to support the sovereignty of Ukraine as much as the Ukrainians wish to exercise it. So I have a response to that, but I will yield to the next question. <laughs> then we may come back to you, Bill. I'm going to call on Matilda. I'm going to read Keith's question in chat. Give chance at, uh, Tom a chance to reply, and then we'll go to Giselle and to Gary. Matilda, you have the floor. Yes, I have two questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm in Oslo, by the way, so I'm closer to Ukraine than the US. Um, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on or what expectations on the next NATO meeting in a couple of weeks? What do you think they will decide? Uh, the other thing is you were talking about the weaknesses of or the, the need for weapons for Ukrainians. But what are the weaknesses in the Russian army? Because they don't have uh, an unlimited supply either of weaponry and things they need. So what is what is your take on that? How is the situation? How will it devolve over the couple of next months? So, I mean, my argument for the needs of the Ukrainians is, is really totally unexpert, and I'm, I'm now just repeating the words of uh, Ukrainian uh, government and military officials with whom I've been in contact in recent weeks and months, you know, they're asking for the heavy artillery that uh, is able to counter Russian uh, artillery batteries, the HIMARS systems and so on, but they also need the small arms and the body armor, the night vision goggles and the, and the infantry capability in order to exploit terrain at a lower level. And so I'm, you know, there there will be other people who will disagree with some of that, but that's what I've been told. Now I also think that they they need um, the um, uh, drone technology and 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 that gives a sort of a cheap version of iStar, but a very effective version of iStar. And I think that's where they really need to, you know, we need to be able to supply and assist. Your question about Russia, though, is really interesting because I think. I mean, frankly, the big surprise, well, there were two big surprises uh, of February 24th. The first big surprise is the, the will and determination of the Ukrainian people. I think that's, you know, the spirit that we've seen evidence was a surprise to many, and I've got to be honest, and me too. Um, but the other big surprise was the complete failure of the Russian armed forces. Um, not its total failure to mass and to, 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 to deploy, but its failure to sustain its, its logistics, uh, you know, complete the complete corruption of the Russian armed forces, which on one level, I suppose, shouldn't be a surprise because, I mean, after all, if corruption starts from the top and let's not kid ourselves that it starts anywhere else, 
Um, it's, I suppose, hardly surprising that each of the generals at every level have stolen 10% of the fuel or 10% of the money or 10% of the food, so that you end up with armed forces who are then trying to act in uh, Ukraine that have been so eviscerated by corruption that even those units that are supposedly well equipped turn out to actually have much less capability than uh, we were we were expecting. So I think I think the, the surprise, if I may, the surprise on the uh, failure of the Russian armed forces is something that I think we need to we need to look at quite hard because you know I, I, I mean, many of us have read and some of you, Giselle, I'm looking at you in particular, and and, and Gary have written about. Uh, the capabilities of Soviet forces in over the last 20, 30 years. And I think for all of us, not, not well, certainly for me, um, the, the staggering uh, incompetence of the Russian armed forces has been a, has been a real surprise. Uh, I, think, I think many of us expected them to be better, or at least better equipped, or at least uh, more technically capable. Uh, but we've seen that even the you know, even those tank battalions, those tank regiments that were supposed to be upgraded turned out to be pretty Potemkin, you know, that turned out that they were, you know, one or two uh, pretty fancy tanks, and the rest of them were not quite horse and cart, but certainly looked a little bit in that area. So I think that's the, that's my surprise with the Russian armed forces. So, Matilda, thank you very much. Uh, before I go to Giselle and Gary and then Yulia Georgia waiting in the queue, Keith has something, something in chat. I read it on his behalf. Uh, Tom, how do we manage or break the Black Sea blockade? Look, that's, um, that's a question of will. Um, the reality is that we've demonstrated with the sinking of the Moskva that um, the Ukrainians are perfectly capable of pushing back uh, Russian shipping from those seaways. They're perfectly capable, yes, with some assistance. I'm not denying it, but they're perfectly capable with their Neptune missiles and um, uh, some extra surveillance capability to uh, push Russian naval forces further away. B but the question of will is also on us. Are we willing? Are we willing to ask uh, Turkey to escort shipping into Odessa? Are we willing? to flag grain carriers as Turkish, Bulgarian, Romanian? Are we willing to uh, see this as an essential seaway, in which case we enforce uh, the UN law of the sea? Or do we see this as part of a state-on-state a -state conflict in which we're not willing to have any part? And it's, uh, you know, again, we come back to a question of will. Uh, and on this side, our will, not just Ukraine. So I think that there's a there's a question there, and I think it's one of the areas that we really need to look at. But if I may come back just briefly to Matilda's point, the reason this is a question of will is because the Russian Air Force has still not achieved air superiority. The Russian Navy has demonstrated no serious capability to achieve uh, naval dominance uh, in the Black Sea. And the reality is that Turkey's military, or rather naval uh, capabilities, uh, are, are way superior uh, to Russia's in the Black Sea, and could certainly, if it chose to, uh, exercise that, able, that ability to influence the export of grain and other goods uh, from Ukraine. Terrific. Thank you very much. Giselle, you have the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you, Tom. Uh, and you've, you've been very artful in avoiding talking about Britain so far. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Trust you to pick holes in my arguments. <laughs> well, Britain has played a very important role, uh, and and no doubt would do during this uh, window you described. I mean, uh, uh, Boris Johnson's behavior is sort of the exception that proves the rule with him, I guess. Um, and and of course, uh, that has not gone unnoticed uh, either in Ukraine or elsewhere in Eastern Europe. I guess my question is, given the prime minister's sort of uh, wobbly uh, domestic politics, um, do you see the, that firmness continuing if he were somehow to be uh, removed? Uh, and particularly, you know, uh, what are some of the, uh, you know, it's difficult to imagine 
a, a labor triumph in any real way, but but beyond Boris, tell me there's something that's equally as uh, you know between Boris and you, where's the where do we retreat to? Well, uh, I, I think and there's quite a there's quite a spectrum there. <laughs> the uh, look, I mean, I think I think the reality is this is one of those uh, strange policies where actually you'd find that even a Labour administration, God help us, but even a Labour administration would uh, maintain a similar level of commitment. This is this is not something that sees, you know, whenever whenever there are questions in the House, the uh, the, the questions to the relevant minister of foreign defence or even the prime minister is why haven't you gone further faster? Why haven't you done more? Why haven't you helped? You know, why haven't you done extra? The question is never why on earth are you getting involved in a foreign country about which we know little? You know, the reality is that this is uh, this is something that's really sort of not just whole of government, but whole of country. I mean, I think it's I mean, it's worth saying, I you know, I live in a community in rural Kent, which is, um, for those of you who know it, is actually the capital of the known world uh, and indeed God's own slice of paradise on earth. Um, and every one of our perfect villages and every one of our perfect churches and every one of our perfect homes uh, pretty much has a Ukrainian flag somewhere. It's really quite noticeable that, you know, the Ukrainian flag has become almost as prevalent as the Union Jack. Uh, in uh, towns and villages across the United Kingdom. I was up in Carlisle a few weeks back uh, and at least half a dozen homes of, you know, perfectly ordinary middle-class houses, I mean, nothing, you know, particularly stand out about them, had Union Jacks. And very often what you'll see now is you'll see a Union, uh, sorry, they'll see, you'll see Union uh, Ukrainian flags. And what you'll quite often see now is you'll see uh, flags that are half the Union Jack and half the Ukrainian flag. Uh, and it's, you know, there are various reasons for it, but uh, I mean, I think it'd be very hard to argue in the UK that we don't care about Ukraine today. It would it would really not play well. I mean, it, you know, on simple domestic politics, it would be it would be a bold call. Giselle, thank you, Tom. Thanks, Gary. Over to you. Uh, great. Uh, it's great to see you, Tom, and uh, thanks for taking away from your golf game this morning. I uh, really appreciate you, you know, sort of making time for us. Uh, quick question. What do you think this, I mean, reading the tea leaves, what do you think about, or what do you think the status of the Finnish and Swedish application for NATO membership, where it lies these days? Uh, sorry, uh, forgive me. Yes, you, somebody asked that question earlier, and, 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 I, and I missed it. Forgive me, that was my mistake. Um, look, where do I think NATO is going to go on this? Um, I think that's, you know, I think were it not for Turkey, I think they'd be in now already. I mean, you know, it'd be going through in, in Madrid with, without any obstacles. But I think the, the reality is that Turkey has, for various rather obvious reasons, um, got an interest in, in, in pushing certainly the Swedish case much more than the Finnish one. Uh, in order to extract uh, uh, some form of uh, compromise. And part of this is clearly because of their perception of the way that uh, Sweden hosts um, various Kurdish fighters or former fighters or, you know, uh, fundraisers. And, and part of it is because of the way that Turkey feels, sometimes correctly, um, that it's seen as a sort of part NATO member. I mean, it's quite noticeable, for example, that at the time of the coup attempt in Turkey, when was it now, a few years back, not everybody was quite as quick in condemning the coup as I think we would have been had it been, you know, Estonia or France or Poland. Uh, and I think it's certainly true that uh, Turkey is correct when they say that sometimes terrorist attacks happen in Turkey that are not as, con not as condemned as those in Paris or indeed, of course, in New York and Washington. Uh, and that they have a, they feel sometimes that they are a little bit the, uh, you know, the stepchildren of the relationship rather than the full, uh, the full member. And I think there's a, there is some element there that you know we all have to do, which is to recognise that Turkey does have legitimate uh, defence interests that we haven't always championed in the way that I think we should. But I think that's part of the answer. I think the other part of the answer is we all need to uh, increase our recognition that actually what Sweden and Finland have asked for is a completely reasonable uh, request and that Turkey, I'm afraid, as a friend and partner, also needs to recognise that too. 
Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And Julia, you have what may be the last question. We'll see. Uh, no, we have a little bit more time. We'll get in one or two others. Julia, you have the floor. Your audio is down. It, it looks like you're unmuted, but the audio is not functioning. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, I was saying hi from Bucharest, where I have been now for um, the last few days. And about something that you just mentioned, Macron was just at Bucharest and said um, that we must essentially convince, said it to Romanians, we must essentially convince Ukraine to negotiate with Russia, essentially for partitioning. So I'm wondering if that hastens sort of what you um, were describing at the beginning as, as one of the scenarios. Um, and in that context, I'm also wondering how, if you can describe to us the other, the worst scenario, um, if the Biden administration decides to um, not support um, this war with what Ukraine needs, um, then Zelensky, from what I see and hear from Ukrainians, um, can say what he wants. But um, as soon as he will say that uh, Ukraine is willing to give one inch, he will probably be removed in a way or another because the absolute majority is not agreeing with that. So I wonder how this scenario then looks like and how we, the West, can then explain to Ukrainians what um, their options are in case we're sort of um, in this situation in which the Biden administration would decide not to put, as you described, the industrial base at the disposal of Ukraine. Thank you. Well, look, I, I wasn't aware of Macron's comments in Bucharest just now, so forgive me, but uh, but you're exactly right. I mean, it, 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 it's a continuation of the issue that I'm afraid many of us have called out uh, in recent weeks, which is it's perfectly reasonable for President Zelensky to make the comments that he makes, which he quite often says, which is this will have to be resolved in talks and you know we'll have to come to some form of agreement and so on. Which he said pretty frequently, frankly, but it's something—it's it, something else for other people to say it, right? I mean, it's—it's it, it's something else for the president of France or the president of the United States or anybody else to say it because it—it it suggests a pressure on the Ukrainian people that is not for us to make, um, and so, you know, I think it does raise that second possibility more highly. I think you're correct, and I think you're also entirely correct to raise the simple fact that if President Zelensky um, were to were to make compromises beyond that which he thinks he can sustain, then the Ukrainian people quite reasonably would decide that they wanted a change of leadership. And President Zelensky's remarkable ability uh, to unite the Ukrainian people and to, to lead a war effort that frankly is you know, exemplary in its, in its strategic uh, uh, commitment is is really absolutely essential here, and and we shouldn't ignore the fact that actually, you know, Putin is not just trying to defeat Ukraine on the battlefield, but he's trying to undermine the support which is sustained. I mean, I'm reminded today of the story that I was reading uh, only last night about a Baltic uh, pumping station for gas that apparently has got a part. You know, it's gone down because there's part missing and or a part is broken and they are appealing to Siemens for the spare part and the part apparently has to be made in Canada. I'm not sure of exactly the details, but I do wonder and I, I mean, I have no evidence for this at all, but I do wonder whether the Russians aren't simply testing uh, the commitment of the sanctions regime by pretending, breaking, whatever you wish to put it, um, apart and see how the sanctions regime holds when our own gas needs uh, become under severe threat. So I, you know, I do think that the the challenge we've got is that when we get to October, November, when uh, you know gas shortages don't cause price rises but cause deaths uh, because of the cold in Europe, whether or not we're going to see um, that level of pressure increase, and therefore um, comments like President Macron's become even more divisive. So I look. I mean, I. I take your point entirely, and and I think that you know the game that Putin has tried over many many years is to uh, pick the leader in Kiev, uh, and he tried to do the same thing again in the twenty fourth of 
February, and it's only because Zelensky demonstrated courage and then Wallace flew out end laws that, uh, that he didn't get that choice. So, Yoya, thank you very much. We are now in the home stretch, four and a half minutes to go. Bill Galston, whatever it was on your mind 20 minutes ago, uh, I would like to invite you, if you like, to join back in for a penultimate question or comment. You're muted. I'll be happy to, but not to exclude other first questions. So why don't you solicit that? No, no, and, no one's and, waiting uh, right now. Bob, I'll so get back in if there's more. Does anybody, I don't see any hands raised. Marco, is your hand raised? No, I don't see another hand raised. Anybody see a hand I'm missing? Giselle, you're not a first questioner though. Be brief, Giselle. Bill will follow and then Tom, final words. Giselle, go ahead. Well, I have to find the unmute the button. Um, <clears throat> quick question, uh, kind of a follow on to, to Julio's. So um, if there's a split in the Atlantic Alliance, which it kind of seems there is between the United States, Great Britain, and the, those countries who most directly face uh, Russian aggression, and particularly France, Germany, and Italy, that, that results in an unsatisfactory outcome to the war. How can you see the alliance, um, what do you see as the future for the alliance under such circumstances? Um, <laughs> And the alliance has been on the various strains at various different points, and the split that we're seeing is not unlike the old Europe, New Europe split that we saw at various different points in, I'm thinking here, particularly around the year 2000, um, that you you and I, when, when you and I first met, actually, Giselle. Um, and so it was, uh, yes, yes, that was 20 years ago. The, <laughs> the, oh, uh, it's not causation. <laughs> <laughs> quite right. The, um, you know, but that... Um, <clears throat> the strains are real, right? Um, but but I'd be careful about overstating them because the reality is that the Alliance really is about the Alliance and the, and the Allies. And even though I think the war in Ukraine is incredibly important, you know, let's not forget Ukraine is not a NATO state. Uh, uh, and so, although it is, I mean, I think fundamentally in our interest and it, you know, has important lessons and here, you know, you know much better than I do. It has lessons for places uh, in the East, not just in the West, and which is why Japan and South Korea and other countries have been so uh, supportive of the sanctions regime. It, it isn't the same as NATO's sort of internal sort of church, if you like. It's not, it's not the single point of failure. It's, it's, it's still NATO acting as a collective you know, policy tool rather than as its primary purpose, which is a defense agreement. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too negative, but I do think that strains are strains and you shouldn't encourage them. Giselle, thank you. Bill. I'll, I'll frame my follow-up question in the form of a statement. Uh, and I would put it this way, uh, Tom, you have used the word will repeatedly and properly, uh, but will only gets you so far. It is a necessary but not sufficient condition for achieving your aims. Uh, there are also facts that resist the will uh, and some of them are stubborn, some of them are intractable. Uh, you have framed the responsibility of the United States along a single dimension, that is to be Ukraine's arsenal. Uh, I would argue that the responsibility of the United States, particularly if it plays that role, includes being an arsenal, but goes beyond it. And uh, I am thinking about a scenario three or four months or five or six months from now, where the Biden administration does exactly what you want it to, Ukraine does its best, and its best is not good enough to reverse the tide of battle. I'm asking myself, what are our responsibilities 
in the United States in such a circumstance. And I'd be interested in your speculations on that question. I'm, I'm very cautious about speculating. Um, <laughs> I, look, I think, I think the way that um, the allies in NATO have handled this is, is right. I think turning this into a NATO operation would be a mistake. And, you know, I admit, before you ask, I admit that I'm slightly being pedantic in saying that this is bilateral aid from many countries who all happen to be members of NATO to an individual country that happens not to be, is not the same as a NATO operation, but it isn't. It isn't quite the same. And so I think that has been important because it's been, it's made it harder not impossible, but harder for Putin to make this a Russia versus NATO conflict. And you must have seen the jokes that are going around Moscow, where it's, um, <clears throat> you know, first few months of this war, this is a war against NATO. Uh, what are the casualty figures? Well, on our side, you know, ship, planes, men, equipment, etc. Uh, and on NATO side, well, they haven't joined the war yet. You know, that's a that's a useful joke to be going around <laughs> Moscow, right? It's a very useful joke for, for Moscovites to be, to be cracking. So I am cautious. I, I mean, I accept your question, but I am cautious about saying that we should go much beyond what we're doing now. And I, I focused on materiel, but you know, we both know, Bill, that the US is supplying uh, intelligence and other capabilities that are assisting. I mean, it's not by accident that so many Russian generals have been killed. It's not so, it's not by accident that those snipers happen to know where the generals are. Uh, and, you know, some of that capability, by the way, has been supplied by individuals. I mean, Elon Musk's Starlink capability has been enormously important uh, because it's meant that the Russians can't switch off uh, the comms between the Ukrainian forces. You know, th these things have been fantastically important. But I am, I remain very cautious about saying that we should go much beyond that in terms of actually committing troops, not because I don't wish to defend the Ukrainians, actually I do. I think, you know, my heart says we should, but my head says that would be to expand the war. It would make the defense of Ukraine harder. It would make uh, the conflict more protracted and likely it would cost more Ukrainian lives. So mm -hmm. my argument is we should do as much as we possibly can to maintain Ukraine's capabilities without making this a NATO-Russia conflict. So, Bill, thank you, and all of you. This has been uh, a fabulous three quarters of an hour. Thanks for your time. Tom, this was, uh, as always, just super sharp and stimulating and challenging and Godspeed, and we hope to speak to you soon, but really a fine briefing and discussion. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.